<laughs> what makes Andela epic? The people. You're given the opportunity to grow into whatever your potential really is. It invites innovation, talent, and diversity. Andela was born of a simple premise. Brilliance is evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. Our mission is to connect talented individuals to roles that can be done anywhere you want to be. Andela supports work-life balance by providing opportunity to work absolutely remote and gives us an opportunity to have a, a family life, have a personal life, and still be extraordinary in impacting the lives of our talent uh, and our clients. I really got hooked on Andela uh, when I heard about the mission. Connecting brilliance to opportunity, regardless of race, gender, or geography. That got me hooked. I have joined Andela as I come from Brazil, and I have been impacted directly by being connected to opportunity that wouldn't exist otherwise in my local country. What do I love most about my team and department? The people. Everyone just works together so well. Uh, they really respect one another's opinions, and it truly feels, it feels kind of like a family. It feels like home. We act as one group, one team, and we all help each other succeed. Why should I join Andela? It's a great question. I would turn it around and say, why wouldn't you join Andela? We have brilliant people that you get to work with every day. We have a mission that is at the core of every single person who works here. And every day you learn something new and you have a new challenge. And at the end of the day, you're making the world a better place. One, one moment, one meeting, one laugh at a time. So what made me join Andela? A legal statement in my job description. The legal statement was all about why we want you here. And it was all about all the, the traits and characteristics that make up humans. And when I read that equal opportunity legal statement, I actually got a tear in my eye, and it ended with, Andela is home for all, come as you are. And I knew that I was home at Andela. How would you describe Andela in one word? Diverse. Collaboration. We solve solutions together. Flexibility. I would say inventive. Brilliance. Opportunity. Epic. The future of work. Innovative. Impactful. Hope hope that when I look back on my life, I can see that I have done something meaningful with it. You're not discriminated on your age or race or color or tribe or whether you're male or female. You just come there and you're a superstar doing your thing and making an impact globally. That's Andela. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Rosario. I'm Talent Marketing Coordinator at Andela. And I'm already seeing that uh, everybody's introducing themselves um, in the chat and where are you from? And I see people from Namibia, from Congo, from Zimbabwe, Lagos, Nigeria, Kenya. Well, there's a very diverse audience today. Um, so I guess this is going to be very enriching. And I see some returning names. So happy to see you uh, joining again for uh, with us uh, one more time. So um, before starting today's session, please uh, make sure um, to adjust your audio settings, as Asma has already shared in the chat. Um, if you're on mobile and have the possibility of moving to a laptop, please do so for a better experience. And remember, these sessions are being recorded. Uh, we will share some links after the session for you to find everything um, after. So um, for those of you who are new to Andela, um, so who are we? At Andela, we know and we recognize there is a lot of brilliant people out there. And we work to connect those brilliant minds with great and amazing opportunities. And we provide support and community to help you grow and expand your career. So what happens when you join Andela? You get access to lots of benefits like a global talent community where you will find mentorship, ideas, opportunities to speak up like these sessions, flexibility, educational advancement opportunities. So um, we are here today, why? Because 
we at Andela, we are committed to gender equality and empowering women to take center stage. We know this uh, is a male dominated industry, technology, and we understand how difficult it may be for women to gain the recognition and success they deserve. So we have created this space, this initiative uh, to offer female technologies and all genders, all genders welcome, uh, the chance to learn from the best. So without further details, I would like to introduce today's fantastic speaker. So Shay Batstone is a San Francisco native who has spent over a decade working for fast growing technology companies, including Cosis.com, Block, that was formerly Square, and Swift Innovation. She's very passionate about scaling global teams and helping businesses have positive social and environmental impact. While her experience ranges across customer growth, new market expansion and product strategy, at Andela, she focuses on strategy and development for our fantastic talent network. She is currently living in London, where offline you will find her teaching, teaching yoga classes or volunteering with the Entrepreneurial Refugee Network for underserved communities through real estate development and investment. So welcome, Jade. Thank you for being with us today. Hello. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rosario. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here today and speaking about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, imposter syndrome. This is a topic that um, I chose to speak about because it's something that I've struggled with at various points in my career. And I know many colleagues and mentors who have as well. And frankly, it's not something that we talk enough about. So I'm thrilled that we have this opportunity here over the next hour to really unpack it together and hopefully come away with some actionable learnings as well. Uh, let's go ahead and just check out our agenda here. Um, so we'll get into today, what is imposter syndrome? We'll talk a little bit about uh, the causes, uh, the impact that it can have when it goes unchecked. Uh, I'll share a little bit about my personal experiences with imposter syndrome and ultimately how to let it go, uh, some strategies and, and practical tools for overcoming imposter syndrome. And then we'll finish off with some Q&A. So before we get too uh, deep into our topic, I did want to share a little bit more about myself uh, and my career journey. Um, as Rosario mentioned, I'm originally from San Francisco and my first job in, in tech was a startup um, called Causes.com, uh, founded by Sean Parker, who was the Napster guy, uh, as many of you may be familiar with him. Um, it was an app that was integrated with Facebook, and you might remember back in the day getting invitations to sign petitions or take pledges um, for social causes. So that was, that was Causes, and I was part of the campaigns team developing content and building app functionality for some of our 170 million digital users. And I loved working at that intersection of tech and social good. Uh, so in 2014, I was drawn to another local startup um, called Square, uh, which was founded by Jack Dorsey. And that was all about economic empowerment for small businesses. I joined as one of the first account managers at Square and uh, worked to build out our customer growth and retention function and our teams across the US. Uh, through IPO and fast forward to 2018, I relocated to London, uh, where I now live, trading one uh, foggy city uh, for another, I suppose, uh, with, with London. And it was really to help launch Square in the UK. Um, at that point, I moved over into a product strategy role, looking to localize a lot of our features um, for the UK market. So that was me at Square. Uh, and later on in, in 2020, um, I had the opportunity to work for a much larger uh, and global company called, called Swift. And there I was leading cross-functional teams, building proof of concepts and exploring new frontiers in the cross-border payment space. Like how can we connect mobile wallets in Africa to the traditional financial system to make remittance payments cheaper, faster, and easier for economic migrants? Um, there's some really great um, work that we did digging into those type of topics. After that, like many of us uh, in the 2020 type years and after the pandemic, 
Uh, I took six months off. I was feeling quite burnt out from all the lockdowns. Um, so I took some time to travel and fulfilled a long held dream of mine of getting my yoga teacher certification. Um, so with that behind me in last July, I was delighted to join Andela, um, where as Rosario mentioned, I now focus on strategy and development of our global talent marketplace. So that is uh, me in a nutshell. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of my career journey. Um, but enough about that. And let's move on to today's actual topic, which is imposter syndrome. Before we dive too far in, um, I'd love to actually hear a little bit from, from you all. And I'm curious to know, you know, what have you heard about imposter syndrome? Um, how would you define it? What are some terms that you would associate with imposter syndrome? Uh, please write in the chat anything that comes to mind. Any words off the top of your head that you might associate with imposter syndrome? Um, any Anything that you've heard before? Self-doubt, maybe. Yep, follow. Doubt, exactly. Fears, insecurities not feeling good i'm seeing yep it's not a great thing imposter syndrome it's really annoying actually it tends to get in our way uh, lack of confidence uh-huh exactly low self-esteem yeah thank you hassan for that so there's lots of folks putting things in so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts um i think we have a pretty good idea but let's hear from mrs obama could be quickly talk one of my personal heroes, Michelle Obama, very quickly on the topic to see how she defines it. Ooh. I love that. She has such a powerful way of describing it there, doesn't it? Doesn't she? It's feeling like an imposter in your own life. It's heavy stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, here, here's the official definition um, in the, this is the American Psychology Dictionary. And, and they'll say, the situation in which highly accomplished, successful individuals paradoxically believe they are frauds who ultimately will fail and be unmasked as incompetent. So this is the American Psychology Dictionary, right? This is a real thing. And we can't easily just dismiss these feelings. Um, it's an actual psychological phenomenon that has been widely studied, has real effects, um, some of which we will, we will get further into. So that's the definition, but what are some of the symptoms and, and what does it look like? Let's name some of those now. Um, it's that feeling like we haven't earned our accomplishments, right? So even when you're put into a new, a new role or a new position, you might feel, ah, oh, it's just by luck that I got here, right? Um, and I don't really know if I'm fully equipped for it. You might tell yourself, I don't know if I deserve it. Um, we might believe that our ideas or skills are not worthy of others' attention. So it's that not wanting to take up too much space in a conversation or a general feeling of not being good enough or smart enough for what you do. And worst of all, it's living under this fear that you're a fraud, right? Or, or that you might be found out. Um, and it doesn't have to be rooted in reality. Again, these are all things that happen inside of our heads. It's all imposter syndrome. And the truth is that a lot of people have these same thoughts. Um, as recent studies show that about 70% of adults may experience imposter syndrome in their lives. Uh, and, you know, naturally you might be thinking, okay, Jade, if this is so common, how come it feels like it's just in my head, right? The fancy psychological term for this is pluralistic ignorance, which basically just means no one's talking about it out loud. While we each are second guessing ourselves privately, we believe that we are actually alone in our doubts because a lot of people aren't really voicing their own, their own thoughts about imposter syndrome. Uh, and this is exactly why we need to have sessions like these. We need to talk about it. We need to share our experiences with one another and ultimately be lifting each other up. <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, sharing another piece about imposter syndrome, sneaky imposter syndrome, is that we tend to fall into this trap of thinking, Okay, I have imposter syndrome now, but once I advance enough in my career, once I reach a certain level of success, surely these nagging doubts will finally leave me, right? 
Unfortunately, that's not really how it works. Uh, paradoxically, studies have actually shown that the more successful or the more skilled that we are, the more likely we are to think that we're faking it because in these we can't really imagine other people you know being bad at their jobs because we're good at ours. Take Emma Watson, for example, a hugely successful actor in her field. Uh, you may, if you're a Harry Potter fan like me, know her as Hermione Granger uh, in that series. And she says, it's almost like the better I do, the more my feeling of inadequacy actually increases because I'm just going any moment, someone's going to find out I'm a total fraud and that I don't deserve any of what I've achieved. So this is classic imposter syndrome, right, folks? And it just goes to show that it never completely goes away, no matter how much success that we attain. However, what we can get a lot better at and improve at is how we choose to control imposter syndrome, right? What, how we manage it um, in these situations when it, when it does arise. And that's why a lot of us are here today, right? We, we're looking for those actionable tools and these strategies um, that, that we can really deploy. So now that we're a little bit more familiar with imposter syndrome, let's just get a quick read of the room. Um, I'm curious to know, a lot of folks have already been saying, oh, this is so me or this is so true in the chat. Um, but I'm going to go through a couple questions. And uh, this is about kind of how much we relate to imposter syndrome. Um, so you can use the chat just to answer yes or no, uh, if any of these uh, questions really speak to you. So the first one is, have you ever felt like you don't deserve your achievements? Yeah, a few folks saying, yep, this is, this is one, or questioning, maybe it was luck, or maybe it was different circumstances. Not everyone, um, but yeah, definitely a few folks resonating with this one. I'll go on to the next one. Oops. Uh, have you ever worried that people will find out you are secretly not worthy? After a success, do you dismiss it as just good luck or timing? Oh, if oh, I wouldn't have gotten that promotion if I didn't, um, you know, spend so much time, um, if I didn't live in the same country with my boss or spend so much time with them, if the situation had been differently, you kind of try to qualify it. Yep, some people are, are relating, not every time, but sometimes. <laughs> okay, how about this one? Have you ever worried that you have tricked others into thinking you are more successful than you actually are? Yes, some folks resonating with that one. Maybe it's the way that we write something on our resume. Um, I know sometimes like on, on LinkedIn, when I'll write a certain thing or something that I've achieved, I'll think, oh, am I exaggerating? Is this really what I've done? You kind of question yourself in that way, right? Uh, it's, it's imposter syndrome. Okay, one more. Do you often apologize for yourself even if you didn't do anything wrong? This is an interesting one. Anyone ever start sentences with, I'm sorry, or just tend to say sorry all the time, even if you're not actually sorry, but you just want to qualify your statement and make it sound nicer? Some folks. Okay, actually, this is the last one. Do you ever fear that others overvalue your success? Maybe, maybe not. Well, if you answered yes to even one of those questions, you have experienced imposter syndrome at some time. Um, and uh, hopefully we're starting to see through the chat box and through people's answers how normal it is to feel that way. And that actually, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are dealing with it. Let's move on to where are these feelings actually coming from? So we can look, take a look at some of the root causes uh, of imposter syndrome. There are broadly five different types of people or archetypes who will struggle with imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. And I'll go through those now. Uh, apologies in advance if you are feeling very triggered or seen by any or like me, most of these. Um, there, yeah, some of them just are a bit too close to home. Uh, but let's go through them now. So firstly, the perfectionist. Uh, so a perfectionist will feel like their work has to be 100% perfect 100% of the time. You know, there's no such thing as good enough when it comes to the perfectionist. 
even if they achieve their goals, they'll tend to move the goalposts, right? Or set the bar even higher. Uh, that's, that's definitely one type. Um, another is the expert. So for, for this archetype, it's about the self-worth is really about what or, or how much they know, um, and they can never really quite know enough. Um, so it's folks who will, uh, in some cases, shy away from applying for a job if they don't meet, you know, 100% of the criteria, or if they feel like, oh, I'm not really qualified for this opportunity because um, there's always more that I can know, right? Next, the soloist. Um, so these type of people tend to be very individualistic. They prefer to work alone. Um, their self-worth is a lot about their productivity. Um, so asking for weakness can really feel like, a, um, or sorry, asking for help seems like a sign of weakness. It seems like something you should be able to do yourself. You should be able to take on yourself. And, and even when you do need help, it's not something you, you feel naturally inclined to ask for. Number four, the superhuman or the superwoman. Uh, these folks will measure their competency by how much they can juggle, how many different roles and how many different tasks can, can they take on at once. And if they do let one task drop or something drop in, in that juggling scheme, they feel a lot of shame because they feel like, oh, I should have been able to handle that, right? Why can't I do everything? Uh, but of course, we know it doesn't work like that. Lastly, the great mind or the natural genius. So these people um, will believe that they need to be indeed like a natural genius. Um, so they judge their competency by how easily or how quickly they can get something done as opposed to what they actually achieve. Uh, like the perfectionists, they set their bar really high, um, but they'll uh, really get angry with themselves if they don't achieve something on the first try. Right. They, they want it. They feel some shame around that. Like it should have come easier to them, even if it's a completely new task or a completely new type of role or experience. Um, so those are some of the root causes um, and some of the personality types that can really lend itself to uh, feelings of imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm very curious, again, to hear in the chat or see in the chat box, rather, if there were any of these types that resonated with with you. Does anyone feel like they're more of a perfectionist or a superhuman, natural genius, soloist. Any, any, uh, any folks seeing themselves reflected here? Perfe yeah, some perfectionists. Interesting, you know, expert soloist. So kind of a mix. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I feel triggered by all of these. Uh, ultimately, I really think you can be a mix. Uh, and, and the important part is that we start to recognize the symptoms of imposter syndrome, identifying where they're coming from, and that makes us in a better position to, to fight them and combat them, right? Because we can call ourselves out almost and say, hey, am I, am I letting my perfectionist qualities take control here? Or, you know, am I, am I looking at this um, through the lens of reality or am I trying to be too much of a superhuman we can, we can really um, be honest with ourselves more in these type of situations. Uh, okay, uh, let's go. Now that we have a little bit of practice, let's put some of that knowledge into action. So I wanna see if we can in fact recognize some of the telltale signs of imposter syndrome uh, in, in this video clip. Um, and this is just a short clip from a film called Election. I'm not sure how many people have seen this film. Uh, it came out in the late 90s and uh, stars Reese Witherspoon, who you might recognize. Uh, she was a high school student, uh, Tracy Flick was her name, and she was running for class president at her high school. I think that's all you need to know about the film's plot. But uh, as I mentioned, it's short. We'll just watch this clip. And I'm curious at the end to see if you can guess which of the archetypes Tracy represents. Okay, so here we go. Wow, that was pretty intense. All right, uh, has anyone seen that movie before, by the way? Oh, okay, we've already got some guesses coming through. Uh, yeah, so a lot of folks have already and correctly identified that Tracy Flick is 100% a perfectionist. Uh, you can see this come out throughout the film um, but even in this clip here, you know, she falls into this trap of wanting everything to be done just right. You know, she couldn't rest while that poster was even just a small, it was, it was hanging on the wall. It was fine, but there was a small corner of it that was off. 
and she couldn't walk away. She had to come back and, you know, due to her um, OCDness or perfectionist tendency and trying to keep it upright, it led to this total emotional breakdown. Um, yeah, she, she probably could benefit from some yoga or some meditation or something. Uh, but in any case, it really illustrates, you know, that point here and the, the trap that perfectionists can fall into of, of wanting everything to be uh, 100% perfect. Okay, I did want to uh, yes, so I wanted to cover this a little bit. Uh, why are women most likely to experience imposter syndrome? Here we all are in the women's speaker series. Um, and, you know, this is something that Michelle Obama mentioned um, in her in her talk as well earlier on. And it comes back to this point about being a minority in any given situation, how that tends to make us feel um, when we're not, you know, when we're not represented uh, fully. So. These are just some stats here from Lean In, which is a uh, U.S. organization that covers women in the workplace. And uh, you can see, you know, for every 100 men that are brought onto teams and elevated to management, only 72 women will experience that. Men hold 62 percent of manager level positions, while women hold just 38 um, percent. So if you see less people of your gender at a certain level or position of power, it's really no surprise that you might question, well, what am I doing here, right? If you if you then get elevated to that position. Um, there's also this other piece about the stories or the narratives that we commonly hear. Um, these are some stereotypes, uh, you know, women are not good leaders because they're too emotional or women are not good at math or science. Even if you intellectually know these are not true, um, if it's something that you hear enough, even subconsciously, you can start internalizing it. So it's something that we should acknowledge and we should be aware of um, so that if we do catch ourselves reiterating these narratives in our own heads, we can go, OK, wait a minute. Uh, is it actually true that I'm not good at this thing um, or I can't do this thing or Am I, you know, am I listening to um, a story that I'm just telling myself or something that maybe I'd heard in the past? Um, so that's uh, a few pieces uh, around around why uh, women tend to be more affected by imposter syndrome. But why does this matter? So let's move on to the so what section. You know, what impact does imposter syndrome have specifically in the workplace and in our careers? Well, there are uh, there are really a few a few things that can happen, right? So, first of all, we can lose out on opportunities. Uh, just look at LinkedIn. Uh, there was a Harvard Business Review article that came out a while ago, and it talked about uh, why women are less likely. I think women apply to twenty percent less jobs uh, than men do, and the report showed that the reason why is that. Uh, women are less likely to apply for a job if they don't meet 100% of the criteria listed in the job rec, um, whereas men are happy to apply if they meet 60% of the criteria. Um, they, they, they found this after studying a large population um, of folks who are applying for jobs. Um, so important for hiring managers to keep in mind as we strive to be more inclusive in our hiring practices, um, but also for all of us, you know, checking our own perfectionist tendencies. And if we're looking at the, at the job description and it's saying, um, you know, we need you need 10 years of experience in order to apply for this role. Maybe we have eight. Is it still worth giving it a shot? Why not raise your hand for it? Um, these are things that we can that we can be thinking about. Right. Uh, another impact um, in uh, limiting our potential. So, you know, we may have been in a situation where uh, we, we, we don't raise our hand to take on a new challenge or a new opportunity um, because we're, we're too fearful or we don't speak up because we have a point in our mind that we want to make in a meeting. Um, but we wonder, oh, does that sound dumb? Or I, I bet someone else is going to make a better point than I will. And, and these are small things, but on, you know, at, lots of small things over time really have an effect. Um, so they're all things we can be aware of. And lastly, and probably most detrimentally, we can overwork ourselves, leading to burnout. I think we all saw that uh, in the video clip with Tracy Flick, right? Um, if you do watch the film, you'll see that she spends 
lots of late nights making campaign posters and writing speeches. She's taking on so much herself um, and it leads to this total emotional train wreck that she has, right? Uh, in the same way, we can you know, work ourselves to the bone um, because we, we think we have something to prove, we take on too much and, and we end up um, really burning out. So these are, these are what the, the pieces that we're working to prevent, right? Um, imposter syndrome unchecked uh, can really derail us and, and where we wanna go in our careers and let's not let it, let's not let it ultimately. Uh, here is uh, another quote from a woman I respect quite a bit, Lena Dunham. Uh, she's probably most famous for creating and starring in the TV show Girls. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole quote because it is quite long, but um, what we can take away, she's basically talking about being a very young woman and <clears throat> feeling like she did have a lot to prove um, when she got into that, that deal with HBO and the TV show. And so she worked herself really hard and uh, she was always afraid that someone was going to find out that she you know, didn't deserve to, to have that TV show into her name. Um, and what it, what it really robbed her of was, was the joy and the excitement of coming to work every day because she always had anxiety. Um, and it's, you know, another potential negative impact of imposter syndrome is, um, yeah, in taking the enjoyment out of our, our day to days at work. Um, so that's another piece to, to be aware of. Okay. So moving on, we've talked a lot about imposter syndrome now, what it is, where it comes from. And I, I mentioned that I myself have had, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple experiences with imposter syndrome at various points in my career. Um, so I wanted to tell you about what a few of these have been and uh, what lessons that I've in some cases painfully taken away um, around, around overcoming imposter syndrome. So the first experience I'll talk about um, was something that happened to me at Square. Uh, several years ago. I, at the time, was leading uh, customer-facing teams. And uh, one day, my boss was out of the office at a conference. And I remember walking onto the floor and all of a sudden, like all the phones start ringing. And anyone who's worked in customer support or account management will tell you this is not a good sign. Um, as it turned out, there was some kind of bug in the app and it was preventing our users from being able to accept payments. Uh, our, our, you know, our customers were busy restaurants and coffee shops. So you can imagine that was quite a, a big issue. And this was affecting some of our, our largest and our most uh, valued customers. So everyone's there, everyone's freaking out. Um, we're speaking to our tech team. And, and meanwhile, I got my phone out uh, to text my boss. Uh, and I remember I started off the message with, hi, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry to bother you at the conference, but here's what's happening and describe the situation. Uh, fast forward, um, ultimately we, we were able to get those issues resolved and we all moved on with our lives. But the next week my boss pulls me aside and you know, I'm thinking of course, oh no, what have I done wrong? What am I about to get in trouble for? for? I'm, I'm running through you know, all of the actions I'd taken and thinking, what did I drop the ball on? But instead, she asked me something that I didn't expect. She goes, Jade, why did you apologize You know, when you texted me? You were right to let me know what was going on. You were doing your job and you, know, you didn't need to be sorry about it. And then she gave me some advice that's really stuck with me. She said, okay, whenever you're having this urge to be overly apologetic, I want you to replace it with gratitude. So instead of starting your sentences with, I'm sorry to bother you, it becomes, hey, thanks for taking the time to hear my concerns. Or if you're you know, just one minute late for a meeting instead of going, oh, I'm so sorry, it can be, hey, thanks for taking the time to wait or thanks for waiting for me. It really won't feel natural at first, I promise, but with some practice, you'll start getting the hang of it. And it is, again, seemingly a very small shift or a thing, but what we say matters and how we position ourselves um, is important and we can do so with more confidence and, and assurity. So that's one tip I wanted to pass on, replacing apology with gratitude. Moving on to the next one here. Um, so this is again back to kind of earlier in my career. I was promoted to be a people manager um, and I remember at the time I was one of the youngest on the leadership team. 
um, I was having a lot of insecurities again, just based on my age and um, thinking, okay, uh, I'm just going to work the hardest. I'm going to take on the most tasks and people will see how busy I am. So then they'll know that I deserve to be on the leadership team, right? They'll know because they'll see how much I have to do. Well, as of course, it didn't exactly work out that way. Uh, instead, I was being pulled in so many different directions. I was spread far too thin. Uh, and I wasn't actually able to have a big impact in any one direction because I was doing too much, right? And I started to realize that instead what I could do is at the beginning of a week, I could look at my week and say, okay, what are the three most important things that I can get done this week? Uh, and even if something small drops off in the meantime, uh, it doesn't matter because I'm still able to make an impact where it counts and in the areas that matter most to my boss or to the company and are most kind of strategically aligned. And, you know, the other thing that happened is um, I realized with my peers, I was looking for them to respect me more when they saw how much I was doing. Um, but actually, when I started to say no, I got way more respect. And it was all about shifting the perspective around my priorities. So if I was able to say, hey, um, you know, these are the three things that I'm focusing on most this week. Um, so here's what I'm intentionally not doing, or here's what's less important. Um, that's where, you know, you've heard, I'm sure, working, um, working smarter, not harder, right? In this case, we're also placing value on our own time. So um, for instance, uh, if, if a project would come up and someone says, hey, Jade, can you, can you take this on as well? I can say, sure, um, but this week uh, I'm I'm laser focused on X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, what what would you recommend I deprioritize? That's you know, if you're talking to your boss about it. Or the other thing you can do is ask about you know the timeline. Or hey, these are three things that uh, you know have an urgent deadline for end of this week. Um, can I can I understand better the timeline for this other project? And is it something that we could pick up next week instead? It's it's just about that kind of conserve conservation of our own time and energy, but also how we're positioning it um, in order to, uh, you know, get the maximum impact and respect from our peers as well. Uh, I love this visual that you see here uh, really kind of illustrates how you can uh, have more impact through focusing on a few important things versus letting your energy go in all directions. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's move on to uh, taking some of those, you know, principles and putting them into action again. Um, so we'll have another uh, quick group activity. And the way that this will work is I'm going to share a few sentences. These are things that could come up in your average workday. Uh, you know, maybe you yourself have said them a few times. I know I have. These are all taken from personal experience, by the way. Uh, so anything that you see here as like the wrong sentence, I've probably said. Um, and the idea is that together we're going to work and rephrase these sentences. So in the chat, um, I would love to hear what some of your ideas are um, for rephrasing this first one. So the sentence is, I just wanted to see what you think about this. What do we think? How could we um, rephrase this sentence? So convey the same message, but, but say it more confidently. Does anyone have any ideas um, about that? I'll give you guys a, a few moments to think. Okay, Here's, here are a few folks coming in. So uh, Azichi is saying, what do you think about this? Okay, great. So we're removing the qualifier at the beginning of the sentence. We're removing the, I just wanted to see. No, I wanted to see what you think about this. You're giving more emphasis to your idea. I'm interested in your opinion about this. Ooh, that's another good one too. What are your thoughts? Can I get your input? I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Amazing. So we've got lots of great ideas coming through. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback is one I had, which is very aligned with what everyone is saying here. The basic point is we're taking away, again, that just at the beginning, um, we're making it a bit stronger and we're uh, saying that, hey, we, we have an idea or we have an, um, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I wanna hear what you think. Exactly. How about this next one? I'm not sure this makes sense, but can we do it this way? Hmm. 
So you start off a sentence already, you're kind of doubting yourself, right? You're already qualifying what you're about to say by saying, I'm not sure this makes sense, but what do you think? So is there a way that we could express that differently? Okay, here's some great ones. Uh, Janet saying, I have an alternative thought on this. Putting your idea out strongly. Let's see this another way. I like that. Rosario saying, here's an idea. Why don't we try this? Exactly. No need to qualify it. Just saying, hey, what about this thing? Here's my idea. Here's what makes sense to me. Unless you see any red flags, I'd like to try it this way. You're already putting forward that you're expressing that, hey, I might have thought about this. I've probably weighed a few different options. Uh, a trap I often fall into is over explaining myself. So if I want to put forward a certain idea, my tendency will be I should explain all the other ideas that I already thought about, what the pros and cons were, what I weighed. And actually, that's oftentimes too much information. And again, more often than not, uh, the other person trusts that you already did all that analysis anyways. Um, so just framing in this way is, 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 uh, is, is sufficient and a lot more confident. Okay, one more. I'm sorry to bother you with this, but I need some help. So this is back to, you know, 2000, 2014, Jade, uh, where something's going wrong, all, all heck is breaking loose, and I'm texting my boss, I'm sorry to bother you, but I need a little bit of help. Is there any way that we can frame that a bit differently? Yep. So this is probably a nightmare for any soloists out there. So any folks who, again, asking for help is a sign of weakness, um, are probably not enjoying having to do this, uh, but how could we express it? Okay, so there's some great options coming through here. Um, yep, I need your help if you have a moment to spare. Please, can you help me with something? Great. <laughs> There's something I'd like your help with and would appreciate a few moments of your time. And so with this, we're, again, expressing that we need the help, not qualifying uh, that we might not be worthy of that help, uh, might be a waste of their time. Um, we trust that, you know, we know when to ask for help. And we're also, uh, we're grateful for it, right? There's the appreciate, um, I appreciate a few minutes of your time to get the help. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for uh, everyone sharing your ideas here. Uh, this might seem, again, like a very small thing, but actually the way that we speak has an impact on a daily basis. So if we start to practice some of these principles, you'll often catch me, for instance, I'll still to this day write, write a sentence or write an email and I say, oh, I mean, I, I really said just a few times or I really qualified that. Um, and so I think uh, you could just have a mind, a mind to do that uh, with, with your day to day. Hopefully it helps. Okay, uh, so let's go to the more positive part of this, right? So we've already had the practice. Um, let's go to some some strategies for letting it go. Any any Frozen fans out there? I'm hearing Elsa in my head singing "Let It Go" as I say this, <laughs> but maybe not. And everyone thinks I'm crazy. Let's go on to some strategies. Uh, I've already shared a few from my own personal experience. Here are a few more that I've both tried and are also. Um, yeah, kind of recognized as uh, as great strategies for imposter syndrome or overcoming it. First up, um, recognizing the signs and taking action. So we've already covered what some of these signs are, right? We know what to look out for now. It's the self-doubt. It's the being overly critical. When you catch yourself in this negative thought spirals, uh, we can take some action. So you might be, you know, sitting at your at your at your computer, or your laptop, you might be writing an email or on Slack and you're having all this imposter syndrome in your head. Take a pause, take a beat and, you know, close the laptop, um, take some kind of action. The image here is Amy Cuddy, uh, who I believe her TED talk is like the second most popular of, or most watched of all time. 
and she talks about power posing. Uh, you can see her here um, with the uh, Wonder Woman action. She's basically taking up a lot of space and her whole concept is that our, about our mind-body connection and actually what we do with our body will influence the way that we think. So if we have this big powerful pose, we'll also start to feel more powerful. Uh, as a yoga teacher, I would talk about warrior two or mountain pose where we're standing tall and the effect that that can have uh, on our psyche. Uh, so that's a really great one. Um, I honestly have gone and done 10 push-ups or a quick power walk around the park, anything to really get you out of that negative headspace and, and start to feel a little bit more empowered. Um, so that's one. Next up, documenting your achievements. Um, I was told a while ago to start keeping a, a success file. So this is just a file like on your laptop, or it can be a physical one if, if you want to print things. But whenever you get an email from a boss or a colleague that says, great job, or you smashed it, you did so well at that project, or thank you so much for helping me out with that thing, take a screenshot or save it and put it into your success file. Uh, and then you have this great file of things to revisit on a rainy day. Maybe you're not feeling the most confident or you're feeling a bit sad. Um, you can go check out your, your success file and really prove to yourself, actually, I've done some pretty cool things or, oh yeah, I remember so-and-so said that um, I was pretty great. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, keeping one of these for yourself if you don't already. And finally, probably most importantly, realizing that it's not just you. And we've gone a long way towards, you know, proving that in, in the session today because we've really shared and been honest with each other about our experiences. Um, so whether it's joining a forum like this or speaking with a friend or a mentor, um, it's a great way to feel like you're not so alone um, and someone can you know, help you to realize that, uh, yeah, you were totally qualified for that job. Um, even if in your head, you're, you're really not feeling that way. Chances are that they've gone through something similar. So, so talking about it's really helpful. Um, I would also say, particularly for women and for the women managers out here, if you if you promote someone onto your, your team, who's also a woman, just taking the time to tell them that they deserve to be where they are, that deserve the success that they're getting it can go a long way and something that, you know, not everyone feels all the time. So um, definitely having a performance manager uh, tell you something like that or, or you yourself tell that your reports um, is, is quite uh, valuable. Finally, we're going to... I love this quote from Mindy Kaling. I'm not going to read this quote for obvious reasons, but everyone can read it here. Uh, and I wanted to end on this because it's really an attitude that I would love for all of us to come away from this session with, you know, why not me? Why shouldn't it be me? We, we know all about this imposter syndrome now, and we understand how to identify it, um, understand a little bit more about where it might be coming from, that it's not just something that we've made up, right? Um, and, you know, it's probably when we're feeling it, not something that's always rooted in reality. We have our, some tools and some strategies at the ready. So I, uh, you know, coming to this point in the session, feel we can all commit to one another that we're not going to let imposter syndrome slow us down. We're not going to let it stop us from achieving our goals. We're going to ask ourselves, why shouldn't it be me? Should be me. Is that a deal? Deal, everyone? <laughs> Sound good? Great. Well, well thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go into a bit of Q&A now. So I think, Rosario, if you'd like to join me, uh, we can move on to that section. We have a few minutes left here to, to go into Q&A. Rosario, I'm not able to hear you. I don't know if others are. There must be an, an issue with the I'm microphone. sorry. <laughs> I was you thank you, Jade. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for that session. That was um, amazing. Uh, if, you, if you can move to the next slide, uh, before jumping into a Q&A, you can start uh, dropping your questions into the chat or into the Q&A tab. But I would like to uh, share some uh, useful information with you all. 
So um, what's coming up? Uh, remember that um, we have uh, one more session, which is going to be in two weeks. Um, we are sharing the link to register in the chat right now. Asma is going to share. Um, and remember, we'll keep the discussion open, uh, both in the Andela chat. And we invite all of you to join our Andela learning community. Uh, please go to the chat again uh, to find these uh, useful links. Um, and joining the Andela learning community would be super useful for you, not only to keep up uh, building your skills, but also um, uh, being able to share with people within your region and others. And last but not least, um, remember to stop by the Women Live Women uh, website, where you will find the recording of this session for those of you who asked, and all the details um, and registration link for the next one, which is um, listed there. So now, yes, let's jump to the Q&A. Let's see, we have some questions for you, Shade, here. So first one, after back-to-back -back rejection mails from recruiters, how can one be encouraged to remain positive and overcome imposter syndrome in applying for more jobs? Ooh, that, that is definitely a tough one. And I, something I can certainly relate to. I've gotten a lot of rejection. In my time, um, I would say, again, back to some of those same strategies that we spoke about, right? Um, understanding that it's not just you um, kind of taking some time to look at the broader job market and kind of understanding that these, you know, these, these factors are happening. Um, I would say as well, you know, talking to a mentor or a friend, you know, maybe sending your CV or your cover letter to a friend and having them read it. Um, and, you know, that can help you to get out of your own head, maybe get some thought, some, some tips and advice too. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an, an ongoing struggle. There's no magic, magic solution or magic bullet there. Awesome. Glad to know. <laughs> Lots of us have, have gone through that. Okay, there's another one here uh, related to um, something we saw in the presentation. Uh, this of replacing... Um, I'm sorry for gratitude. So they're getting into a meeting late. Isn't it prudent to say, I'm sorry I'm late? Or you meant, thank you for waiting for me. I'm sorry I'm late. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, again, this is very contextual, right? And saying I'm sorry if, if it's, um, it's worthwhile or if it, it's uh, warranted is definitely something I would encourage. I want to just put that up there. And if you are late for a meeting or if people are waiting for you, yeah, apologizing for it. What I was emphasizing is that uh, oftentimes, and women are are more um, likely to over apologize. So saying sorry, even when we haven't done anything wrong, right? And I think that those are the times that we have to be more um, more on the lookout for, right? So things like, oh, sor sorry, I just wanted to. I, I would often do that if I raised my hand during a meeting. I'd say sorry, one, one point. It's like, I'm not sorry, I, I wanted to share an opinion. Or if someone cuts you off, um, that's actually happened to me as well. I'll be speaking during a meeting and someone will interject when I'm not done speaking. I will tend to say, sorry. Instead, I'm trying to say, uh, excuse me, I wasn't quite finished instead of sorry, but why would you apologize for someone else cutting you off? Those are the, those are the types of things I'm talking about, right? Um, in terms of the over apology. Yeah, definitely if you're, if you are in the wrong, saying uh, apologizing makes sense. Hopefully that's a, a clear distinction. Perfect, yes, it is. So um, one more, um, is this a case of imposter syndrome? If you are staying with someone and you're always saying well done for the person to feel appreciated, is that okay? Please, I need your elaboration. Hmm. So it's about giving compliments to people or, you know, rewarding a job well done. I, I don't know that you would necessarily call that imposter syndrome. I think it's good to lift one another up and, and recognize achievements, right? Um, and then, you know, I think it's about being able to sometimes tell ourselves that we've done a good job. Um, sometimes we doubt ourselves, even if we have achieved what we wanted to achieve, we, we can be overly critical and say, you know, could I have done that better? Um, and, and that's really what we want to be on the lookout for with the imposter syndrome. Awesome. Thank you. 
Well, I'm pretty sure uh, there will be um, more questions maybe coming up later. So um, remember that we have these uh, community spaces where we can keep sharing. And of course, you can always um, message us um, if you need support with any of these. So Shay, thank you. Thank you very much. This was an amazing session. It was full of great advice and ideas, for sure, that we will try to put into practice. Thank you, everybody, for attending. It was um, a great pleasure to have you all. Um, and remember to join us next time. We will be very happy to have you again. And have a great day, everybody.